Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and today I'm here with a very special guest, Miss Margaret, who is an optical engineer at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. During our conversation today, Miss Margaret will discuss her journey to lead to who she is today. Welcome Miss Margaret, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. Thank you for the invitation, Gitik. I appreciate it to be able to share about what, what I do and share my passion and potentially recruit people that have similar interests out there. Yes, I'm very excited to get to know about your journey. So before we kind of get into the like nitpicky details, I'd like to know about your role and your job um, when you work at NASA. Like, What do you do on a daily basis? So my days depend, and, and it really depends on the time of the year, and it certainly has been different now during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I was working from home, so probably about six months, for, for about six months, I was doing all my work from home. And I was really lucky because at that point, there wasn't a lot of hard, tangible hardware on site, so I had to write a lot of the plans. So whenever we do, whenever we send anything to NASA, everything that we do to the parts that we're gonna send to NASA to out in space um, has to be like very carefully documented because we wanna be able to trace, you know, if something goes wrong, we wanna say, you know, did something come up that looked suspicious before? You know, who handled this? Who did the cleaning? When was this done? What were the conditions? Just in case something comes up that's a little bit weird or unexpected. Um, so, so we have to write all these plans ahead of time that says we plan to do this and they have to be reviewed by a ton of people and approved by a ton of people so during my time home i was able to write all these plans and now hardware has come in so now i'm actually out there executing the plans that i wrote but as you can probably you know predict um as much as you plan you know things don't always go along according to plan so we we write a lot of what we call deviations so that so whatever your plan was you can deviate from it but then there's also a very formal process where you formally write a deviation people have to approve it um so it's a combination of doing lab work working with hardware and you know documentation preparation for that work and then writing summaries and then doing some data analysis as well yeah, I was this was kind of expected, like scientists in general, you do a lot of lab work and reporting. Is there any specific project you're working on right now that you, you can share? Yes, so I'm currently working on the Roman Space Telescope, which is going to be the successor um, to the James Webb Space Telescope. So currently the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting our planet. We will launch next year the successor to Hubble, which is called James Webb. And then it, we're planning in the mid 20s, um, so in the next few years, we're going to launch the Roman Space Telescope, and that is going to be a similar size to the Hubble Space Telescope, so about the size of a, of a bus, that is going to be 1.5 million miles away from our planet, and it's going to be looking at early galaxies. Wow, that's really cool. So I'm assuming it's way more advanced than the telescopes you guys have currently. Well, so it is because it'll have, you know, whichever telescope we send has the latest technology, but it takes us a long time to be able to, you know, once we start building the concept and then we start actually building this stuff, it takes us a long time from building a concept to when we actually launch. So it's probably, you know, the state of the art from a few years ago, but by the time it actually launches, it won't be the state of the art, but it will be the most modern that, that was at that time. One important thing of why we send new telescopes is that different telescopes have different capabilities. And you know, like Hubble that's orbiting you know, around our planet is looking at the visible and UV part of the spectrum. So it can take pictures you know, with light like we can see. James Webb will be able to take pictures in the infrared. We don't have the capability with our eyes to be able to see in the infrared. Um, and James Webb will have a higher resolution than Hubble. Now, Roman Space Telescope will have the same resolution um, as, as Hubble, but it'll have a really large field of view and it'll also be in the infrared. So the wonderful thing about these telescopes is that they have different things that complement each other. So it'll be, you know, different capability in terms of resolution, a different capability in terms of uh, spectral operational range. So what type of light is it looking at? And different capability in terms of field of view. You know, does it take a high definition, short, you know, smaller field of view, or does it take a really wide angle field of view photograph? Yeah, I know. It's like you guys always constantly build on what you guys already have to create something awesome. better. Yes. So it was really cool to know about. I didn't know about this new telescope that you guys are creating. So it's very interesting. Um, 
So I know you guys, uh, so one day I'd like to potentially work at NASA and I'm sure many people who are watching this potentially would love to work for some sort of space organization when they grow up. Um, so when you were younger, I know both of your parents worked at NASA. Did you, or did, or did you have parents in the space industry who um, had, a, no, you didn't actually. Okay, so I was thinking something different. Um, so how did you get into like the space industry? Like what motivated you? When did your passions get identified? I think, um... It, the doors just open. I didn't know that this was, I, I always had a passion for science. Okay. I always loved math. Um, I grew up in a pig farm. So my, my dad, um, you know, would run, would run the pig farm and my mom was a stay at home mom. And mm -hmm. um, I just was always really interested in, in math and, and I was good at it. You know, if you're interested and you're good at it, that, that makes it, you know, that like best combination. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that really helped me identify that I wanted to stay in a STEM related field. I studied my undergraduate degree in physics in Mexico, and I immediately identified that I wanted to continue to advance my education. I wanted to, to go into a specialized field. For some time, I struggled between um, deciding between if I wanted to go to astronomy or optics. And then I did um, uh, an astronomy camp and I didn't like it. So then I was like, okay, okay. Then, well, that was out. So that, um, you know, and that's, that's how things happen sometimes, right? You sort of have this, this high expectation, like I'm going to do this, it's going to be awesome. And then you try it and you don't like it, but that's still a really good thing because you identify that that's not where you want to go. And maybe, you know, it's a little bit disappointing at the beginning because that's not really what you wanted, but at the end of the day, it still is something that, that helps you. So even though, um, you know, I didn't never thought that NASA would be achievable. I volunteered to help um, coordinate a physics conference at my university in Mexico. And a NASA scientist came to my university and gave us a talk and said, you guys should apply for a summer internship. Never at all thinking ever that I could ever apply or work at NASA or have anything to do. It was sort of random that I was just doing extracurricular activities, just planning something within physics. And this opportunity came about. I applied. I got accepted. I was placed in the optics branch, and I discovered, wow, there's a thing where people study optics, and that's what they do as a profession. And I fell in love, and then here I am. Wow, that's amazing. I'm actually, I actually applied for an internship this year as well. So because of you know the pandemic, obviously I can't go in person. I know they do have a few in the spring, so hopefully I can get a great experience as well. But it's so inspiring to see that like. You can actually just from an internship, it, you know, you've got a career out of it, which just shows a few things could change like your whole journey, I guess. Absolutely. The idea, you know, is to be taking small steps, right? I was just doing something to try to to enhance the knowledge of people around me with the physics conference and then ended up, you know, opening this door for me. And through the internship, another formal internship came about and then the full time employment came about. So, you know, certainly this was not something that I envisioned, but, um, and I, I, but I just knew I wanted to stay in STEM and I just kept pushing, kept pushing. And, you know, if you work hard and you're disciplined and you continue to reach out, you know, doors start opening that, that sometimes leads to places that you don't expect. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like when you say you weren't expecting to be at NASA at all, I feel like a lot of people when they're young, they're like, oh, this is like, unreachable, untargetable sort of like organization. I don't know if I could ever work at NASA. So what advice would you give for like children out there who are like, maybe I'm just not good enough for space. Like what is your like take on that? What advice would you give? I probably would say, you know, join the club. I think everybody at NASA were like, we're not good enough to be doing this, you know? So, so we feel, you know, I certainly feel there's, there's a lot of, I hear this a lot, imposter syndrome. I don't know if you've heard that, that people feel that you know, you're in a place where you feel like an imposter. You feel like you fooled yeah. everybody, that you're not really smart. You don't know what you're doing, but you fooled everybody around you, which is a lie, right? Which is not true. You're obviously there because you know what to do. You definitely don't know everything and don't have everything figured out. That's just how we all are. We're learning together and we're figuring out solutions to problems together. Um, but, you know, don't be discouraged because certainly... You know, nobody has this perfectly laid out plan of what you need to do and that's what you're going to get. But, but discipline and hard work and reaching out and talking to people um, is going to open doors. So just, just that constant 
um, motion, just being active to continue to, to do things is going to create opportunities. Yeah, that's definitely important. I feel like I've always heard connections are really important in outreaching to people because, you know, you never know when someone could help you out in a place and help you maybe become who you are. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so what was key to becoming knowledgeable about the industry you're in? Because I know optics is something that until I heard about your job and your role, I didn't actually explore that field at all. So how did you get into optics? Well, so, you know, I was studying physics, so I was, you know, uh, almost 20 year old at that point and I didn't know that you could study optics you know that wasn't the thing that I knew so if I didn't know you know and I was already a, a, a young adult I know most people don't know <laughs> so, <laughs> I was yeah. already in a field where where we'd potentially be familiar with something like that so the optics community is a really small community I think we're growing but it's still really small really niche which is a which is a really good thing um, for us I when I applied to the summer internship at NASA, I just asked to be placed in any engineering field. I just figured, you know, just place me wherever, where I can do some physics, some engineering. And they kind of just sort of dropped me in the optics branch and it was awesome. You know, I didn't, I didn't actively search it. I was placed there and I learned, you know, this is a discipline that you can study. And who was my boss at that time, had gotten his master's from University of Arizona, and he said, you have to go there. That's the best place. You know, he was a really proud alumni. And the program that he graduated from, that eventually I graduated from, was awesome. So I ended up applying. They offered me a full fellowship, which makes a huge difference, of course. And, and it was great. It was a great opportunity. Wow. So yeah, again, it just kind of aligned for you. So that's really nice. Yeah. So did you have any obstacles, I guess, like when you were pursuing like obviously you had to get another degree and everything but did you have any obstacles that kind of were like demotivating almost when you were trying to achieve what you like to work at NASA absolutely you know and and obstacles come up every day right and they can come up in, in multiple they can take multiple shapes and I find that one obstacle that exists for all of us oftentimes is just ourselves we sometimes get in our way you know, of ourselves because, you know, we, we feel insecure because we don't feel prepared. Um, obstacles are also different, you know, if you're male or female, because those insecurities are also going to be different. Um, you know, so, so some of those are, 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 are psychological that we sort of trigger them and, and some of them are real. So when you sign up to do a PhD, um, you have to take, and, and these are called different things in different countries. And if you're in, even in, in the same country in different universities or even the same university at different programs, but you have to take a type of exam that we call comprehensive exams or preliminary exams. And the point of these exams is to show that you are an expert in this area. If you are getting a PhD and whatever degree you're getting, you should show through this you know, very hard exam that you are knowledgeable with all the basics. And the exam normally is very you know, extensive. It'll take multiple days, multiple hours, and people normally study weeks or months for it. You know, it's, a very, it's a very long, tedious, hard exam. It's meant so that you know, if you can't get through this, you cannot make it you know, and, and eventually get your PhD. So actually about 40, um, 40 to 60% of students, at least in the optics program, that take the exam the first time, fail it, and people take it again. So, but that, that's just to show, you know, it's so hard that about half of the people, and, and that happened to me. And, you know, so I remember I was like, I'm going to do awesome, and I studied for months, and I'm like, I'm ready, and I was studying, you know, 10 hours a day. Never have I thought that I would ever study for weeks, 10 hours a day. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and, and you have to, it, they only offer it two times a year. Um, and, and, and once in the spring and once in the fall. So I signed up to take it in the fall. So I was studying during the summer, especially so that, you know, I wouldn't have conflicting classes because if you take it in the spring, then you have to study during break and logistically it's just <laughs> harder. And, you know, and I took it and I thought, you know, I felt ready and I felt confident. And then it was like, nope, you're not there. So, you know, those challenges were, or your question, I sort of had to say, you know, is this really what I want to do? Because even if you, if you, you can choose to leave the program and finish with a master's and not get the PhD, um, the, the exam is only required if you want to get a PhD. So that was a challenge where, you know, 
I had never failed an exam like that. And you're like, you know, this, this will never happen to me. I'm going to get super prepared and something happened, you know, and, and it's sort of giving yourself that leeway to say, I don't know everything. I need to figure it out. I need to try this again. Um, that's another challenge. Certainly challenges come, like I said before, in different shapes and sizes, people and their opinions can be other challenges. I've certainly encountered some comments, you know, from some older colleagues that think that maybe because of the way that I look and the way that I am, that I necessarily don't belong. And again, that's also something that I have to tell myself, you know, I know what I can bring to the table and it has nothing to do with how I look. It has to do with, you know, how I'm thinking. Um, but that, but sometimes that can be really hard, right? All of these, all of these struggles that are real, that have different forms, can really change, you know, what you're willing to do and if you're willing to stay in a field or not. Yeah, definitely. I feel like the fact that you perceived, like, persevered through it is so important and gives a strong message. Like I thought um, through these webinars, I'm actually trying to show people that you don't have to be this stereotypical person to like work in a space industry. I feel like people have this like thought whenever they think space or NASA, they think of these like old, you know, males, you know, and it's like, I'm not that smart. I, I'm not like that educated. I have to be like a scientist. I have to be like Albert Einstein. There was like all these misconceptions. And I feel like as I got to talk to people, I realized it was completely false. And, I, you know, I feel like even when you're in the industry, you feel like you're not good enough. And it's so important, like you said, to remember that you have your own talent, you have your own unique skill set that you need to acknowledge and, you know, believe in yourself. So I think that's a very strong message that you're giving. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, the, the point is that a lot of people think, oh my God, you work at NASA, so you're obviously a genius, you know everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I don't. But but, but what we do have at NASA is a large group of people that were really passionate about what we do. So we try to solve really hard problems all the time. So we're hardworking, we're, you know, we're curious to try to come up with new innovative solutions. So you don't have to be a genius, you know, probably, I am sure NASA has a lot of geniuses, but most of the people that I work with, of course, including myself, we're not geniuses. We just really like what we do that, you know, we will put our heart into making that work. And that that ultimately produces a really positive result. Definitely, I feel like passion is always the number one thing in whatever job you do, you need to have it. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, so to kind of wrap this interview up, I'd like to know about more about your opinions on like the space industry, about like what excites you and what kind of makes you nervous about the space industry? Well, I think it's exciting all the unknowns, you know, right? So statistically, uh, speaking, we know that there is more life out there, and now we've found, you know, proof of water in Mars on the moon. Know, yeah. Exciting things, you know, we're collecting samples from asteroids, we're sending, you know, um, missions further out into, into our solar system. There is just so much to uncover. My concern is that there aren't enough uh, future scientists and engineers to continue to tackle these problems, you know, because I, I'm working with a bunch people in my generation that we're getting ready to tackle these problems but we need more people you know in the next hundreds of years to be able to continue to ask the questions and answer the questions um and my fear is that sometimes for different reasons people are not being interested or being discouraged from pursuing a field in stem specifically of women and minorities and and i feel like it's my job to make sure that you know this, the, the important work that I think we're doing continues. And in order for that to continue, then I have to be reaching out and say, come on, everybody, anybody can do this. You just have to, you know, have the discipline, have, um, have the consistency and work hard to make this happen. Um, so that's my fear. But, you know, as, as soon as sort of like I have that fear kick in, I also get the excitement to kick in and say, you know, but there's so many cool things out there that are yet to be discovered that there has to be people that are interested, that care, that are curious as well. So, so I feel that um, my, my fear sort of decreases and talking to people like you, talking to people like in the Children's Science Center and just connecting through different programs, I tell myself, you know, there are a lot of people out there that, that think that this is really cool. And those are the future scientists and engineers that are going to continue this work. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Definitely agree. I definitely think that people need to just get rid of that boundary. Like, oh, I'm not good enough or I love space, but I can't do it because I'm female or I'm too young. I, I can't, I'm not like old like them or, you know, just get rid of those boundaries that are limiting you and just, you know, drive after their passion. And of course, every single person can be a part of the space industry. Absolutely. Anybody, anybody at any age from any background, anybody. Yeah, you don't have to be like a certain someone or certain ethnicity with a certain economic status to be a part of it, definitely. And one last question, how do you anticipate or foresee changes in your industry? Well, so certainly, um, so two different changes, I think. One of it caused by the pandemic, um, where it's sort of shown us that we can be, in some cases, just as efficient teleworking than being on site. So I think potentially a change is gonna happen, not just necessarily in the space industry, but in the tech industry and maybe potentially other industries where we're gonna see a shift, where we're gonna see more teleworking and we'll see what that does to the world as a whole. You know, contrib you know, CO2 emissions and things of that sort will also have an impact on, you know, on everybody. The other change that I see happening is that we're shifting from this um, public, because NASA is a federal agency um, where we're shifting from this public investment of NASA through being a federal agency to becoming private. So now more than ever, we are partnering with the private industry um, to, to work with them so that together we can continue to, to sort of push the boundary and continue to send astronauts into the International Space Agency. We had this very successful launch with SpaceX you know, that we, we stopped the shuttle program many years ago, and now we're able to, to start it again, but now with different partners. So we're seeing a shift, you know, to becoming more privatized, which also means that now, there, now we have different investors. So more people are interested. We have more, funny, more money coming in through investments, which will open more opportunities to everybody. Yes. I, yeah, that makes sense. I, yeah, NASA is known as like the government organization, but with the partnerships with private industries and like maybe potentially like space um, travel commercially. I mean, I know that's something that people are kind of like, oh, that would be cool if humans could, you know, if, if going to space could be normalized. I'm not sure if it ever will, but it would be very cool if it was. Um, right. So yeah, definitely branching out is really important. Thank you so much for the amazing insight and definitely the conversation about how everyone can be a part of space, which is like the main theme at all my webinars, sharing your story about how you took a failure in a different way in like a positive light is really important for every single person to understand. So thank you so much for you know, taking your time out of your day um, and you know, conducting this interview with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Garrick. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me to be able to talk to you about this and, you know, and help me with, with my uh, passion to continue to recruit people. Yep. Thank you. Bye.